When I first came to college, I wasn't sleeping too well. I was having nightmares a lot about what might happen to the people I loved, the ones I'd moved away from. I was anxious about making the best of my college experience. I moved to the United States for this. It was a massive opportunity and a privilege. I was in the beginning throes of adjusting to life in a whole new country. I was an imposter who didn't belong, couldn't belong, but was determined to. Still, I didn't think much of any of it. These were normal growing pains. Everyone goes through them, right? When I first came to college, I happened upon a booth promoting mental health awareness right by the cafeteria. The folks at the booth asked me, Hey, how are you doing? Would you like to fill out a short questionnaire? And I figure, what the hell? Why not? I dot my I's, cross my T's, and hand them back the clipboard. I think, this is normal. I am fine. The lady at the booth looks through my results and she puts the clipboard down. And she says, When I first came to college, it was my first time in the US since I'd been a child. Before dropping me off, my parents took my brother and me to Disney World, a place we'd always wanted to visit. I was a dumb teenager and kept my camcorder out the whole time, absorbing all the cool things we were seeing. But of course, by the time night rolled around, I ran out of battery, just in time for the fireworks show. I wanted to record it. But when I put that camera down and gazed up at that sky ablaze with lights, I was kind of grateful. I wasn't thinking about a future version of me reminiscing about the past through old footage. I was thinking about me, present, here. Adam Robinson Yu's A Short Hike follows Claire, a young bird spending the summer at her aunt's place in Hawk Peak Provincial Park. Claire takes on the titular hike in a journey to reach Hawk Peak, the only place on the island with cell phone reception. The game takes place on a small open world that feels large and lived in. The people you meet along the trail all have their own stories their own summer plans and hopes and dreams you can lend an ear to. You'll race around the island with new friends, help invent a new sport, go speedboating with a precocious kid who'd never be allowed to speedboat alone. A short hike is all about the journey, rarely the destination. And because I found it to be such a charming experience, I recorded clips of the whole game in case I'd ever make a video on it later. That is, until I forgot to record the ending. When I reached the top of Hawk Peak, I was mesmerized by the lights. Claire was right there with me. She forgot to check her phone, her driving motivation throughout the game. And together we sat in place and just watched the bands of color dancing and swirling around us. We were present. We were here. And then her phone rings. When I first came to college, I was told something in my intro screenwriting class. There are protagonists who change, and protagonists who change those around them. When you begin Adam U. Robinson's A Short Hike, you might be led to believe Claire is going to be the former. She is at the heart of nature, and yet her driving goal is to trek uphill for a phone signal. In a more predictable game, it may have been a premise that lent itself to discovering the joys of nature, to making new friends and memories along the way, to just disconnecting for a little while. But that's not quite what A Short Hike is about. Not entirely. That's not quite who Claire's new friends, some close, some distant, some mere passers-by in the night, are. For a long time I struggled with feeling like I belonged. I did make close friends in college, and I did have close friends back home. But that's also a time in your life when you have to interface with more than just close friends. Conversations with classmates, mentors, and co-workers all made me who I am. But I was also some kid from Bangladesh ill-equipped to have the conversations America was having at the time, ill-equipped to understand certain social norms. I was a high achiever, but so was everyone, and you know what? The more I achieved, the more they kept achieving higher. And for a long time, I sat and I listened. I tried to emulate them. And what I learned was... Everyone has imposter syndrome in a short hike. Okay, that's an exaggeration, not everyone, but certainly most of the NPCs Claire spends her time with. Characters push themselves to their limits, at rock climbing, at sports, at exploring the great outdoors. One obsesses over their fears around the upcoming marathon. One almost gives up on her dream of racing. 
One sits by Hawk Peak, peddling as much as he can to pay for his tuition. Claire wasn't even the character I connected with most. No, it was the artist kid, who struggles with feeling like everything he creates has been done before. Will his work make people feel something? Is what he wants to make good enough for what other people want to see? The way you feel when you're away from home, others feel it too. But the way you refuse to show it, they mask that fear of inferiority too. In a place like college, or a new job, filled with folks from all different walks of life, everyone grapples with their own demons and feels oh so alone, but often they also lose sight of an undeniable truth. They're all alone together. It's because Claire befriends so many of the strangers she comes across that so many of these characters get to open up. It's because I found and spoke with people that they started trusting me with their feelings too. Claire is certainly a protagonist who changes over the course of a short hike. But she also changes the world around her. You do. When I first came to college, I received a phone call shortly after I'd started classes. My nana had passed away. My grandmother lost her husband during the 1971 Liberation War. She was a single mother who raised three kids on two jobs, as a radio operator and as a teacher. I barely knew these things when we lost her. I just knew her as my grandmother. I missed her. In her last years of life, my nana moved in with us. It was her kid's turn to take care of her now, and I would see her almost every day. But even then, as we slowly watched her become bedridden, she somehow continued to be a beacon of strength for us. She passed within two days of my nana bhai's, her husband's, death anniversary. And when she did, I... I wasn't home to grieve her. Everyone you love you will, will die, die and you will be happy home to them. them. Claire is waiting on a phone call in Adam U. Robinson's A Short Hike. It's the kind of call I've waited for far too many times, been blindsided by even more. Being away from home means learning everything through a filter. Being away from home means grief is muddied by guilt. I couldn't be there for my family, but can I really envy the version of myself who could have been? The truth was, I couldn't. I was here. And the truth was, here, there, wherever, their stories and past were a part of me. I was here. The day after my nana died, I dragged myself to class. We had a guest speaker come in and take us to the roof of the class building, from which we looked down upon a beautiful midday view of Boston. And he told us, Your parents, your guardians, your families, you're here now because of them. Take a moment to think about that. I couldn't deny that view. So little changes, and so much feels changed. The first time I returned home was the first I remembered feeling like my friends and family had rifled through new chapters in their lives, ones that I'd missed entirely. Those who had left with me felt like the only constants. Everyone else was coming up against new challenges that even our regular group chats hadn't made me privy to. But the reverse was true too. I was no longer seeing the world through the same lenses we'd once shared. And yet, almost paradoxically, the place we'd always lived, the spaces we'd always hung out in, felt the same. Even as the city lived, breathed, evolved, it was the city I'd always known. Infinite Falls Night in the Woods follows May Borowski, a college dropout who returns to her hometown of Possum Springs. Possum Springs is very much trapped in stasis, and accordingly, its residents feel as though they are too. Years ago, a freak mining accident forced the town to shutter its biggest industry, leaving its economy and job market stagnant. And although May tries to find comfort in her past, she finds that her friends have new lives and new responsibilities now. They're scattered across various low-paying retail jobs. Sometimes they dream of getting out. And though they're happy to have her back, it seems almost implausible. Why would she come back? When you leave home, you take a fragment of your sense of belonging with you. You become someone who lives neither here nor there, not really. Still, you feel terrible for feeling upset about it because you left pursuing an opportunity. You left because the die rolled all sixes on an incredible privilege. If you left of your own free will, that is. There is a moment in Night in the Woods that I think about almost daily, even four long years since I first played it. May's friend B is stuck in a dead-end job. Her father is aging and barely does anything anymore. May gets into a fight with her about why she doesn't just ditch Possum Springs. To the player, the answer is obvious. 
B reminds Mei that unlike her, she has responsibilities here. She doesn't have a choice. And then the game hits you with two small, seemingly simple dialogue options. It's not a choice at all, what dialogue option you pick doesn't matter. You are simultaneously one is to one with Mei on her frustration, unable to conceive of a compelling response, and yet entirely on B's side with the understanding that sometimes, you just have to make do with what you have. The people of Possum Springs resent Mei, and why shouldn't they? So much of Night in the Woods' gameplay comprises Mei simply running around town while her friends and family are at work. The days start to blend together as she, and the player, try to rediscover some sense of familiarity in the mundane. She can be an incredibly frustrating main character to play as, presenting as someone who returned home without a care in the world, but towards the end of the game you learn why she returned in the first place, as a trauma response to an incident her friends don't quite fully understand. But they accept it. They believe her. And that's okay. Sometimes you don't have the same choices your loved ones do, but you can always choose them. So little changes and so much feels changed. In 2017, an executive order is signed into effect that restricts foreign nationals from seven Muslim-majority countries from entering the US for 90 days. Critics call it a Muslim ban. Bangladesh is not named on the list, but my family and I agree. In times like these, it is better to be safe than sorry. It is better that I don't go home. That I don't get locked out midway through my education. Everyone, Everyone you will love die, die to mourn them. be home to mourn them. Even once the coast clears, I stay to pursue a year of post-undergraduate work. Slowly, my time between visits to home lengthened, and with it, the number of chapters I missed in my loved ones' lives. I missed my cousins growing up. My partner and I missed close friends' weddings. We missed funerals. Still, when I would go back, that tension and sense of disconnect gradually stopped feeling quite so heavy. Even on splintered journeys, my friends and I had learned to communicate and keep in touch in a way that worked for us. Some of them even left for different places, came to experience the same feelings I once grappled with. And even on those splintered journeys, we kept finding our way back to each other. As it became harder and harder to go home, the stolen time we had together became more precious. We were older, spending long nights together in our living rooms, talking about all the things we'd promised ourselves we'd never get old and talk about. Towards the end of Infinite Falls' Night in the Woods, May's friends, who she's known her whole life, reveal sides of themselves she hadn't seen before. Greg struggles with his mental health, asks May the impenetrable question, Am I a good person? talks about how he has high days and low ones, and he doesn't know which is which until it's past. May wonders if she and B would have been friends if they hadn't grown up together, stuck in the same town. And there's a word that comes up. Proximity. Does it mean anything that they happen to be friends just because they happen to be in the same place at the same time as children? I don't know. I wonder that sometimes too. But it counts for something, proximity. It really does. Home is more than Possum Springs. Home is people. And even as their lives go on without you around, their trust can be an anchor. A reminder that you do belong here if nowhere else. That their stories are a part of you, waiting for you when you get back. As Possum Springs warps and changes, victim to every shit sign of economic collapse, its townspeople hold on to each other. Even as May spends time apart from her friends, she starts to learn new things about her own community's history. And she carries that history, their history, in a way that becomes crucial to understanding the mystery at the heart of the game. It helps them all move forward. It's hard to come back to someplace familiar and be overwhelmed by the unfamiliar. It's also a comfort to have people there who can fill in the blanks. And make that unfamiliar just a little bit less. May, Greg, B, and Angus daydream about shared futures, even as they plan to move out their separate ways. How they'll take vacations together someday. How... Even without proximity, they'll find ways to be proximal again. So little changes, and so much feels changed. The time between my visits lengthens, and then, in March of 2020, the whole world goes into lockdown. To contain the influx of the people who are 
It is July 2022. In a month, I am going home to see my family for the first time since the pandemic. I get a phone call. My dada is in the hospital. I wait. It is July 2022. In two weeks, I am going home to see my family for the first time since the pandemic. I get a phone call. My dada is in the ICU. It is July 2022. In a week, I am going home to see my family for the first time since the pandemic. I get a phone call. As of three days ago since the time of writing, four since the time of recording, I have no living grandparents. My dada has lived with us since as long as I can remember. She would lost her husband shortly after I was born. She would tell me I had his eyebrows. She was deeply religious and deeply spiritual. She taught us a lot, but in return, we, her six mischievous grandkids, kept her on her toes. She was always at home, so she'd scribble on coloring books with us and join us for movies she couldn't understand. In her spare time, she loved her little television. The last two times I saw her, she welcomed my partner into the family with open arms. I am writing and recording this three days later. Not sure if I will ever make it, let alone release it. If you are seeing it however long since then, then this is me. In the moment. I could not be home to grieve. I am more worried about my family than I am about myself. I cannot be home to hold them. But I will be. Soon. May's friends are not the only ones her understanding grows towards throughout Night in the Woods. When she returns home, she starts to see the toll her dropping out of college has taken on her parents. She starts to see them in their age as people, not just protectors or paragons of perfection. Her father is honest with her about how much he detests his new job. Her mother talks openly about the debt they're in, between read-throughs of various books. Together, the family mourns her late grandfather, who they lost recently. He loved ghost stories. In 1994, French philosopher Jacques Derrida coined the term hauntology, not used to describe haunting by ghosts, but rather by possibilities. Possum Springs is haunted by both specters of its past and by futures it never got to have. Every character shoulders inherited intergenerational trauma from the days of old, and that weight makes it increasingly difficult to move on. But that weight also settles, becomes a natural part of living there. We carry the stories of the ones we love. We carry also the stories of those who made them possible. But most frighteningly of all, we carry stories of generations to come. What will we do with those stories? Who will we leave them with? May's grandfather left her with the love of ghost stories. Three days ago when I got the news about my dada, I turned to a place where I've always looked for comfort whenever I miss home. Video games. That's what this whole thing is about, isn't it? And I booted up Night in the Woods again. I'd played the main story thrice already, so instead, I opened up something I hadn't touched before. The game's expansions. I didn't know what they were about yet. Seeing May and the gang talk under a starlit sky again made me smile. It made me look forward to seeing everyone again soon. But then that reverie ends as May is hit with the realization that she's dreaming. She isn't home. The second expansion, The Last Constellation, as you play through a ghost story May's grandfather tells her when she's younger, the same story she references in present day at the end of the main game. This story too is about a haunting, but its central character, Adina Astra, is not running from a ghost. She's running towards one. The ghost of her late lover, and the ghost of the future they never got to have. Her lover mentions that in death they found the fabled ghost star. Adina sees its reflection in the sky. At some point during the telling, May interjects to ask her grandfather, What is this story about? And he can only reply, What do you want it to be about? That lack of definition is scarier to her than any concrete answer. It could mean anything. It could mean everything. Or it could mean nothing at all. May's grandfather loved ghost stories. And there's a moment during the main game, which is grounded in reality for the most part, when May finds her way to her mom's church after a long day. Her mom suggests she goes and takes a nap in the old library, so you do. 
You can choose when May wakes up, but four years ago when I played Night in the Woods for the first time, I just lay there. I didn't know that if you rest long enough, a smiling ghost comes by to visit. It's her grandfather. He sits next to her for comfort. Still here, somehow. My dada was deeply religious. She passed away on the death anniversary of her husband, my dada bhai, 28 years later to the day. I like to believe she and the rest of my grandparents are at peace now, the peace they always pictured for themselves. I think about that library scene a lot, how May's grandfather got to become a ghost story in the end. A gentle one. There's a moment towards the end of Night in the Woods when Angus and May are watching the stars together. Angus brings up that constellations are just a result of us, people, being pattern finders. We like to see ourselves in things. And no matter what you do or don't believe in, that means something. As he puts it, I believe in a universe that doesn't care, and people who do. It gets easier over time. You get used to the new routine, the new rhythm, the new ways of being. Culture shock just becomes culture. You don't just live in a new place, you learn it. And sometimes you learn to love it. You learn to love the people here, learn to love their perspective, learn to open your eyes to new truths about justice, about action, about your own being and identity, about larger worlds you were once sheltered from. Mobius Digital's Outer Wilds opens with a day of farewell and celebration. You are the Hatchling, a new recruit to Outer Wilds Ventures slated to take off on your first day of space travel. Your friends and family, the ones who raised you, trained you, and the ones you trained and played with, all remind you of life lessons learnt. Through their goodbyes, you learn the tools of the trade. How to pilot and maintain a ship. How to navigate in zero-g. How to use your jetpack and your signal scope and your camera and your little scouting drone. How to use your universal translator to decode messages from ancient civilizations. But of course, there's more to explore here. It is just your first day. Bright-eyed and ready for space, you leave your home of timber hearth behind and take to the skies, and you take to the stars. Where will you go? An infinite solar system awaits and it hits you for the first time just how small you are. A speck of stardust, a droplet in a river, and yet you, little beautiful you, can go fly, swim, rocket anywhere now. Isn't that something? Maybe you'll see the moon. Maybe you'll see the planet of oceans and storms. Maybe you'll see the twin planets joined by a pillar of sand, a cosmic hourglass dancing, flowing, pirouetting back and forth. As one ends buried histories sink beneath sand, the others are unveiled. Or maybe you'll float right back down to Timber Hearth and see what your own home planet is like away from civilization. Maybe you can do anything at all. Twenty-two minutes later, the sun explodes. In Outer Wilds, you are stuck in a perpetual time loop of the day you left home, the same day your solar system keeps meeting its tragic end, over and over and over again. Somehow, inexplicably, the hatchling wakes in the same spot every day and remembers their past loops. The first time you bolt awake, you might run around hoping someone else back home might have realized it too, but no, you carry that story on your own. And so, you go exploring. Outer Wilds is a game about curiosity, and asking questions, and learning. What's causing the time loop? What happened to the sun? What knowledge did the Nomai, the ancient civilization preceding yours who charted and studied these wilds, leave behind that could help? As you explore the game's many planets, each with their own sets of rules and physics and living ecosystems, you learn new pieces of information, one at a time. You don't gain any new equipment, or levels, or anything of the sort. No, you only gain knowledge. And it is knowledge, and again, curiosity, that propels you towards new questions, new mysteries, new discoveries, all tying back to a central core inquiry. 
What's going to happen to us? Everyone you love will die. Belong here. You won't be home. I don't. I can't. Everyone you love will die. I will be home. I will. I won't. To hold them. Everyone I love will live. I will be home. Everyone I love will thrive. Everyone I love will live. I will be home to hold them. My grandparents are not the only ones we've lost while I was here. Phone calls about death were not the only ones that shook me in the middle of the night. I've had family health scares on my mind since long before I left for college. While I've been here, they've continued to be many a source of phone calls. I've had the usual things on my mind too. I cannot just think about how heat waves, climate change, flooding, injustice, a global pandemic affects one country alone. It doesn't. It feels like you grieve in a different language when you're not home. It feels disingenuous to run back and act like you know what your loved ones are going through. You can't. You weren't there. Why weren't you there? Instead, you show up to class the next day. You log in to work the next day. You keep learning and getting back up and relearning foreign lands that will not take you as you are. And you start to experience things your loved ones can't relate to in return. They weren't there. Why weren't they there? And when you try to talk about it all, that sense of too much, you find that it's not a grief that can translate. You are alone in the outer wilds. But you don't have to be. It gets easier over time. In Mobius Digital's Outer Wilds, you have to know yourself, your tools, and your abilities first, and then you have to know its many planets. Each has its own flora, fauna, and physics and each was settled on and documented by the ancient Nomai in a different way. You become the carrier of the Nomai stories, their failed experiments, their tragic love lives, their hubris and their humility become the keys through which you further your understanding of these harsh landscapes. And as you learn to understand them, you slowly feel more at home, even at your loneliest. Others have been here before, on the same journey. Even if they're not here now, you are. You are. Through you, they remain alive. Through them, you experiment, fail, wake up, leave home, and experiment again. There's a comfort in finding empathy with the unknown, and in knowing others trace these unknowns in the same way once, even if they're no longer there. In a 2020 article on The Conversation, Professor Ray Norris suggests the Seven Sisters Cluster might be the world's oldest story. They're a collection of stars, visible in the night sky just a little ways off Orion, recognizable today by their six brightest points. Yet 100,000 years ago, cultures around the world, even ones not yet connected, agreed to call them Seven. Each came up with different stories for why the last, that elusive seventh star, was no longer visible. Various scientific theories posit that it just became harder and harder to see over time. As Norris puts it, Many cultures regard the cluster as having seven stars, but acknowledge only six are normally visible, and then have a story to explain why the seventh is invisible. You are alone in the outer wilds, but you don't have to be. There are others out there with you, stationed at flickering campfires for you to rest at. There are others out there with you, in places you never imagined existed. There are others out there with you, going through the same motions, Making a home away from home feel... more like home. When I first came to college, I was listening to music a lot. So little changes and so much feels changed. But it gets easier over time. Mobius Digital's Outer Wilds is the first game that has made me feel aware of the sound of my own breathing. I don't mean the oxygen meter in the corner of the screen. No, I mean the physicality of inhaling, gasping, exhaling. Deep, heavy breath. In a 2021 interview with Prima Games, Outer Wilds composer Andrew Prahlo states, Looking around and getting stranded? especially if something bad happened and you end up outside of your ship floating through space, the last thing I wanted to do was to have music playing. The absence of music helps create a deep sense of true isolation. Speaking with Noclip documentaries, he also mentioned they used music sparingly to nudge the player when they were close to finding something important. 
when you get into the desolation of space, I think it helps make it a little bit more fearful in areas where there's no music because you really do feel like you're a little bit more alone because all you're hearing is like your breathing and stuff. That way people notice the music and like it actually is meaningful rather than always just being around. By stranding you in silence most of the time, they make those rare notes of music feel all that much more significant. You will spend a lot of time in the dead of space, on crumbling rocks, on frozen wastelands, just trying desperately to survive. There's more to explore here, you know there is. But in the dead of space, space rarely speaks back. The only sounds to keep you company are those of your own deep breaths, frigid and heavy and yet so small compared to the grandiose of the cosmos around you. It's humbling. There are two motifs you will grow familiar with more than any other in Outer Wilds. The Traveler's theme, which is the sound of home. And End Times, which is the sound of impending doom. One is a tune played by all your companions over at Outer Wilds Ventures, a soothing, homely tune that brings to mind memories of nights spent by campfires and stories shared over s'mores. It is a beacon. It is how, on certain planets, you can find your way to a friend and roast marshmallows with them over shared experiences until the sun blinks dead. The other is a tune played to signal the end of a time loop. Your 22 minutes are up. You are going to die. The Sounds of Home Three of my best friends back home were musicians. It was their music I turned to when I moved here and felt my loneliest, because it made me feel connected to where we grew up. We were teenagers, so all I had were shitty mp3 recordings off our phones. But those recordings meant more to me at that point in my life than even my favorite bands did. One of them would send me each new PC composed and I'd have it on repeat, illegible file names V1 Draft 12 sitting at the top of my most played list. They made me think of knights seated in a circle back home, huddled around the twang of gentle guitar strings and sing-song voices in a chorus. Those shitty mp3s were the sound of home. When you're stranded out in the dead of space, ship out of fuel or trapped in an ancient ruin, you don't have to be alone in outer wilds. Your signal scope lets you tune in on radio frequencies around the solar system, and often, when I felt the walls closing in upon me, I'd make my peace and just aim my scope upon the stars. I would tune in. There, I would hear it. From thousands of miles apart, I'd hear them. The sounds of my friends scattered across various planets and yet united, their instruments melding into a perfect synchronization of the Traveler's theme, connecting us back to Timber Hearth, the sounds of home. Each of us, near or far, carried a piece of that music and of home with ourselves. It was familiar. It was comforting. It was warm. It was a reminder we were never alone, even as the ominous sounds of end times, of the new, unknown life I found myself trapped in, over and over and over, took over. The sun swallowed me whole before I could reach my next discovery, and I resented end times. It was the sound of something unknowable and cold and even terrifying. But I remember the moment that all changed, for me anyway. I think every Outer Wilds player has their moment. Mine takes place on the planet of Brittle Hollow, a jagged world with a black hole dead in its center that is slowly swallowing its crust hole. Pieces of earth break and fall from beneath your feet. Years ago, the Nomai worked extensively to find safe spots upon which they could settle, without threat of falling into the abyss. They also built a temple of knowledge into which you can't get in. The entrance has long since collapsed in on itself. I tried to brute force my way into that damned temple over and over again, loop after loop. I would shoot my scouting drone through the window and try to identify it, through its limited lens, if there was any hidden entrance, anything at all. 
I couldn't figure it out until I looked more closely at my scout's analytics, one particularly fateful loop. Surface integrity at X percent. Then it hit me. This temple was going to break. And it clicked in my head that if it broke off Brittle Hollow, I could take my ship and chase its crumbling, floating ruin into space. Maybe then, at long last, I could fly inside and learn what mysteries it was hiding. I didn't think any further of it. I made a beeline for my ship, hoping to get it right, at long last, on this loop. I raced through ruins, dodged falling lands breaking down upon me, and I was almost there when I... slipped. And I fell. I fell into the black hole. The tune of end times kicked in. But when I came out the other side, I wasn't dead. No, I was right where I needed to be. Because I'd forgotten, in my excitement, that the temple would not just break off the planet and float up through space. No, it would fall down. Pulled by gravity, pulled into the planet's core. The temple hurtled, like me, straight into the black hole. And here I was, floating right next to what I'd been chasing in the midst of the cold, blank void of space. And I didn't have my ship. I didn't need it. I floated my weightless body towards the ruin and desperately reached for my translator, absorbing every Nomai text I could reach, absorbing every new piece of information that would help me on my travels, while end times threatened to swallow this discovery, this moment for me, in 10, 9, 8, 7. I read through another scroll. Six, five, I read another. Four, I learn everything I need to. Three, I shut my eyes and let death take me. I am content. Two, I am where I need to be. One, the tune of end times lulls me to sleep. When I read Prahlo's quote about Audre Wilde's sound design earlier, there was a section that I left out. He adds, When end times finally kicks in, it helps convey a sense of feeling at peace and self-awareness of the inevitable reset. The longer you play Audre Wilde's, the more loops you live, die, repeat through. The less of a threat end times becomes. It becomes a sound of another home, another sleep. It becomes familiar. You get used to being away from home, and you get used to sleeping in a new bed. You get used to life with new friends. And eventually, you haven't left home at all. You just have two of them now. When you reach the mystery at the heart of Outer Wilds, you hear triumphant new iterations of both themes as you're hit with the realization that this is it. And then it hits you that even at the end of it all, that music has become every bit much a vessel of your stories, of the Harthian stories, that the texts the Nomai left behind were. I like to imagine that at the end of each time loop, each time I visit home, when the lights are out and there's nothing left to see, our music will keep playing, guiding us along. We'll sit around while our closest friends play a tune to set the scene. We'll catch up over the stories we thought we couldn't share. How have you been? Tell me what you saw. We won't be alone in the outer wilds. We don't have to be. When I was younger, teachers often maligned the cliché of the dead grandmother essay. But is it a cliché, or is it just universal? For young kids, the loss of a grandparent is often their first exposure to death. Their first reality check about the impermanence of life. For those older, it might be their first time seeing their parents vulnerable, defenseless. Asked to be the last line of defense in a way I cannot yet imagine. And for those who couldn't be close by, it is a scenario they have played in their head over and over and over again, trying to prepare themselves, to strengthen themselves in case that phone call ever comes. But nothing prepares for the sounds of a parent's tears, heard from oceans away. There are no words. There is just... hauntology. Most video games are about leaving home, to some extent. I think my interpretations of a lot of my old favorites changed after I moved away. 
Today, I see the Disney worlds of Kingdom Hearts as pit stops. There are characters as friends you meet along your many travels, some fleeting and some lifelong, but all of them significant. I see Spira of Final Fantasy X as a place where culture and character collide, and where you're forced to interrogate your prejudices and consider the perspective of others for the first time. Really consider them for the greater necessary good. Most games are about leaving home, but these are the ones that represent leaving home for me. Games, music, films, stories were my best friends when no one else was, when I felt the most alone. But by sharing those stories with the ones I loved, I found ways to share those parts of myself, in spite of everything. That's what I wanted to tell you about tonight, here by the fireside. I'm glad you stayed and listened. Now tell me about you. It's lonely out there sometimes, but if you follow the music, you might find there's more of us along the way, along this cosmic, winding path of travelers that somehow, inexplicably, always leads you back home.